All right, so welcome to another episode of Off the Crutch. My name is Travis Davis, and this is a very special episode because I have not one, not two, but I have three guests in person. Usually I do my interviews uh, via Zoom, but I am in person with three wonderful physical therapy students, Allie West, Cameron Samurai, and Dylan Warner. So um, how are you doing today, Allie? I'm doing good. Yeah, excited to be here. Right. Right on, Cameron. Uh, hello, hello. I'm super excited for this uh, podcast today. So thank you for having me on. Of course. And last but not least, Dylan. I'm doing pretty good. It's good to be here. It's good to see you again and get to chat a little bit. I'm glad that you brought up See Me Again because last year I spoke um, to a physical therapy class that these three students were in. And I've done speaking engagements in uh, physical therapy classes before. And what I enjoy about doing those is the information that I can share about living with cerebral palsy and just um, you know, how I'm able to um, help the students. Um, so usually there is a lab component to the, the class. Um, and so I thought that it would be great to have three of the students that have worked with me uh, and just have a conversation about what they've learned and just other things related to cerebral palsy and disability. And since um, I am currently fundraising for United Cerebral Palsy, which is a nonprofit national organization that provides resources and services to individuals with cerebral palsy and other disabilities, I thought I could also um, talk about that in the discussion. So here we are, uh, the four of us, and I will start with uh, Cameron. So if you could think back last year, what was your experience like, not only with me, but there were a few other um, guests that had cerebral palsy in the class? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that lab that we did because when we're learning stuff in class, it's just kind of like textbook information. Whereas like when we had you guys come into our class and we got to talk to you, is that in a, like face-to-face -face interaction. So I really enjoyed that. And it kind of like helped me get more of like a better understanding of where you guys are coming from in terms of having the disability and growing up with it and just kind of understanding like the day-to-day just like experiences that you have. So I felt like that was a really powerful learning tool for me. Well, thank you. I'm really glad that you took that away. Um, and I never know what I'm able to bring to the table. Well, I know what I can bring to the table, but I never know what someone's going to take away from it because all of our experiences are so different. And um, yeah, so Dylan, do you remember anything that stood out to you? Yeah, um, I remember it was cool having multiple guests there, like, because we had a guest that was a little bit younger with cerebral palsy. Um, so we got to see kind of experience with him and his mom. Um, and then we got to hear from you and kind of your life story. I remember we had like specific things we were supposed to do with the lab. But when we came to see you, we kind of just talked about your like experiences, what it was like living with cerebral palsy with a disability, which was um, super cool for me, because I feel like before that, I hadn't had much exposure in my life to people with disabilities um, until I got into physical therapy school. And when we had guests in our pediatrics class, that was one of my favorite times to really learn more about that. Um, so it was really one of my first exposures. So it was, it was a really good experience. Cool. Yeah. Uh, anything that was different other than um, Dylan and Cameron that stood out to you, Ellie? Um, yeah, I would say as... Um, as I kind of was on the journey towards PT school, I worked at um, Terry Tingley Hospital, so I had a, quite a bit of exposure to working with children with disabilities. Um, I definitely didn't know, yeah, there were, was still a lot to learn uh, from those kids that came into our class, too, um, for the guest lectures. But um, I thought that when you came in, um, that was one of my first exposures to really working with an adult um, with cerebral palsy or with disabilities. Um, that's just a field that 
I feel like it just doesn't get talked about enough in the whole realm of physical therapy and probably just um, in the world that we focus a lot on kids with cerebral palsy, but I feel like there's a little bit less emphasis on um, adults with cerebral palsy and other disabilities. So I thought that was really powerful to just hear your experience with that too. And um, yeah, it made us really excited. Actually, we had um, to create a business plan later that year. Um, like for a theoretical fake business that we would make if we were to start our own physical therapy practice. Um, and I think you were a big part of inspiring my group to want to make a clinic um, specifically for like adults with disabilities, like adults with developmental disabilities, not just um, like an outpatient neuro for people with strokes and that type of thing, but um, to really continue on that um, like continuum of care all the way through a person's lifetime. That really means a lot um, to hear that because I've been around the block when it comes to physical therapists, especially here in Albuquerque. And I remember one of the therapists that I worked with when I moved back from Arizona back in 2017 um, I was encouraging her at the time to think about starting her own physical therapy clinic. And years later, she has uh, a pelvic floor clinic, which is thriving. And I'm uh, so proud of her. And to continue on just that note, um, right before we started recording, I was talking with Allie about, um, and uh, Dylan and Cameron about their placements. And when they were telling me, um, I found out that Allie is good friends with uh, my first ever physical therapist way back in the day, um, Dr. Mary Beth Barkasy, and just kind of knowing her backstory with uh, Mary Beth and my relationship with her was just really cool to hear because as somebody with cerebral palsy, there's been so many people that have helped me grow um, in like all areas of my life. So, you know, physically, like mentally, spiritually, like emotionally, but, you know, definitely Mary Beth has a really special place in my heart because I've worked with her for so long and I've met so many people that have been impacted positively by her. Uh, knowledge and wisdom. So it's really cool to talk with people that have been passed, uh, that's had information passed down to them by her. So um, that was just like a really cool side note um, right before we started recording. So um, yeah. Was there anything that, uh, let me back up. Was there, um, was that your first experience like working with an adult? with cerebral palsy yeah i could i could go for yeah um yeah like what dylan was saying it was pretty much similar with my experience was working with uh, patients with disabilities i worked at like a outpatient out, uh, outpatient orthopedic clinic um when i was at right before getting into pt school so it's just like the typical like what you think of like physical therapy like oh my knee's bugging me like i'll go into the clinic so like Getting that experience through school, I felt like it was really eye opening because I felt like it was a little bit like intimidating at first when mm -hmm. I was like, "Oh, I haven't had this experience." Like, I really want to like feel, make them feel like heard and like safe with me. So like, and then like when I got to be able to speak with you, chat, so, like it was just really like easy going, and like it just like made me think like, "Oh, he's just another human." Like, just um, it's not not any different really. It's just like, just interact like how you would with mm -hmm. like anybody else. So Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was my, also my first time really interacting with an adult that had cerebral palsy. Um, or I think for me, anybody that had cerebral palsy, I don't think I had had any prior experience to that class, which is why I'm, I'm grateful that we had that opportunity. Um, and yeah, it was also really just changing my perspective on people with disabilities um, and kind of, yeah, it gave me more insight into what it's like to live with a disability. And um, yeah, it was very, very helpful for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for me, um, in terms of first interactions, um, I had I had definitely um, 
had a couple friends, I guess, coworkers, um, actually at Carrie Tingley. And we had a really great social worker there um, who has cerebral palsy. And so um, I definitely had some interactions with him before. I actually did an undergrad um, project kind of focusing on cerebral palsy, and I um, had an interview with him with that. And so I guess I had interacted somewhat before, but it's still, a, it's very different um, experiences for everyone, you know. So I really appreciated getting to see that diversity. Um, yeah, just the ways that it impacts you is very different than the ways that it impacts him and his um, daily life and his work. So, um, yeah, I thought it was really great to get that other perspective. And I'm going to guess that his name was John Chimarusi. Yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's him. <laughs> Yeah, John is a, a great guy, which I spoke to him on the phone um, this week. So it's, uh, yeah, Albuquerque, for people that um, have never lived here, it's very small. And there's so many six degrees of separation everywhere. Um, again, before I started recording, I we were talking about all these people and these connections. And so, uh, yeah, John Chimarusti is a social worker. And Kerry Tingley Hospital was a place that I had a lot of surgeries done there. So it's really um, a really great place for children with disabilities and um, just to get services, yeah, services done there. Any of you, were you afraid of um, when, because in the lab, the students, it was like a hands on approach on working with the individual. So was there any apprehension of, we'll just use me as an example, of um, working with me or doing anything physically um, Yeah, in, in that manner? Yeah, I can touch on that. Like, I felt like it is a little bit of a difference from when you come from like, this was like during our second year of our curriculum so first year was just pretty much ortho based just like getting to know all the hands-on components of physical therapy and with like um in our Pete's class we're learning about all these de de developmental like disabilities and all these other conditions that we have to consider when we're working with these types of populations for patients so like it was kind of like you're kind of hesitant to see like oh like if this pressure might be a little bit too much but um I feel like just being in tune with just having that communication with your patient is very important. Just seeing like what they are like feeling comfortable with and even like just picking up on like different cues. Like if they're like opening up to you or like if they're like kind of like you just kind of have to read the body language. I feel mm -hmm. like is a big thing, too. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that um, I personally was probably maybe a little like apprehensive of like doing the hands on tests that day um probably because i hadn't i hadn't never done those specific tests before and also i had never been like hands-on with like something besides an orthopedic case where you might see some like high tone or something like that or spasticity or something so i didn't really know what that would be like so i think i was a little apprehensive of the hands-on part um but i think we all yeah, what cameron kind of talked about once you like get talking and kind of find out who the person is that kind of goes away a little bit and you kind of get rid of that fear and after that kind of just breaking the ice a little bit I felt like more confident getting hands-on with all the guests we had that day mm -hmm. um but yeah it was just probably because it was the first time for me a little a little apprehensive yeah <laughs> I think since I had had experience yeah. before I wasn't too apprehensive on that day in particular but I definitely remember times before that like as a tech where the physical therapist would be like, okay, your turn to like try to like hold this kid up on this position. And I was like, whoa, okay. So I think it's just a lot about learning to build like, it's that trusting kind of relationship sort of like he was talking about where like, okay, you're trusting me with like your body and I have to like, yeah, work through it slowly and build that relationship. And so, um, yeah, I guess as you learn from each other over time, then it can be a lot. Uh, less of a scary thing but definitely at first it mm -hmm. could be intimidating especially mm -hmm. as students we're kind of scared of everything obviously <laughs> so and i'm glad that you brought that up because one of the things that i mean i love doing 
um, going to the classes and being a part of it. But it can be challenging for myself because I'm having like 30 strangers, right? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. look at me and like examine me and they're, they're examining all of my flaws, right? You know, it's not like I'm coming in there and you're hearing like this amazing talk that I'm giving or, or whatever it may be. You're looking at like the vulnerable and the just like the difficult, like my weaknesses. And so I think um, that can, I, I can understand how that could be taxing for somebody that may not have the like the ability to like process it and at least for me like that's one of the things that I talk with PT students and sometimes physical therapists about you know building that relationship and how you know for like on the patient side it's not necessarily just like the physical aspect but it's also this like emotional um because you know, I know when I was born that my body w wasn't going to be like everybody else's body who was able-bodied, right? And so um, I know that there's parts of my legs that don't work as well or they're not as strong. And it can be challenging to have like this confidence of being a just trying to be a person to do regular person things knowing that there's parts of you that are like broken and so i know that's kind of deep <laughs> but um yeah is there does anything like that resonate with the three of you i think um it what you were just saying sort of reminded me of um we had another guest speaker come in at some point this past year, um, and he was speaking about strengths-based medicine. Mm -hmm. So just the concept that instead of sort of like you were saying, going in and just really trying to pick out, like, let's find every flaw mm -hmm. of this person, because that's really what the medical model generally does, is try to figure out all the things that are wrong and then just try to fix it. Um, but instead of, like, approaching each person, I'm, like, stepping into the situation and seeing yeah, all of the valuable things about that person as a human being um, and just all the strengths that they do bring to the table. Um, I think that that's a really powerful way to kind of change your mindset. And I think that applies in things more than just medicine when you're just out in the community with each person you meet instead of like trying to pick up on what flaws they have, mm -hmm. just try to see what strengths each person has and just the value that they have as a human being not associated with yeah, their ability to do certain movements or certain things. Um, but yeah, I think, again, it's all about that relationship and building that aspect maybe before. Because, of course, if you're coming to physical therapy, you're wanting yeah, to exactly. <laughs> have those, mm -hmm. to work on the things that maybe are um, more problematic for you. So, mm -hmm. But I think jumping in with like, okay, what's, what's your problem is yeah. not always the best approach. For yeah, that. no, I agree. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was a cool hearing your perspective about, um, that experience for you, like coming to that lab with, mm -hmm. cause it, yeah, we're just total strangers and we just jump into like having our hands on your legs and your body and everything. Um, so yeah, I think that's really cool perspective to kind of think about. Um, and yeah, the test we're doing, just going towards the like parts of you that maybe yeah the impairments kind of type of stuff with your legs. So, um. Yeah, I think kind of what Ali talked about, it's really important to just look at the whole person and not just focus solely on like doing those tests, you know, mm -hmm. getting to know them as a person. And um, if you know what, who they are, you can help better treat their impairments by using what their strengths are. And I think that's really what stood out to me with that. Yeah, I, I, I'm really glad that you brought up the mental side. I feel like that, that side to me is like really fascinating, just like that whole like you kind of create a partnership between you as a clinician and the patient. And like you, you guys are like working as a team together to try and get um, to like whatever goals the patient wants. And I, I just find that really fascinating. We took like a 
crossover to some summer called biopsychosocial. Mm-hmm. So then it like incorporated just like thinking of other things like outside of the realm of physical therapy and like just like that inner professional like communication. Um so yeah, it was just like yeah, that was really interesting that you brought up because I wanted to ask like, oh yeah, how was it for you like when you came into the class and like you have so many people like just interacting with you is it overwhelming at all for you? Uh I don't think so. Um maybe when I first started going to the classes and doing that because <clears throat> it was like, wow, didn't know what to expect, but I think as time went on, um I mean, I've always like joked in the past that I've like I'm used to people like staring at me and like, you know, and so I I like I look at it like it's um just part like it just comes with the territory. So there are people with cerebral palsy that may not feel comfortable putting themselves out there and whatever type of situation and they just want to like do their thing and just whatever um but for me i feel like if i have things that can help other people i don't mind putting myself in uncomfortable situations to help others so um while those those situations now are they're not um uncomfortable for me um just like in general if there's something that i can do to help other people i'm like i'm willing to do that so yeah that was a great question i wanted to also touch about like how you said like that going back to that partnership like before we started our um podcast today we were talking about like the different connections you've gotten to meet with mm-hmm. like the people within like the pt community mm-hmm. and i feel like that, like that's just like really cool to me like being a student just like hearing your experiences of like how you've been able to like keep that relationship over time with like these clinicians and they're becoming more than just a clinician to you they're becoming like a lifelong friend for you and stuff like that you know <clears throat> and i'm gonna throw this out there i don't usually talk about my faith on my podcast but i i do think that when i reconnected with mary beth there was some godly intervention because I was actually going to um, a documentary with one of my friends and she invited me and Mary Beth was there and I hadn't seen her in I don't know how many years, but I recognized her. And so um, that's how we like reconnected. And so I do think some of um, these connections have either like been reconnected like divinely or um i've just been able to for whatever reason to um stay in contact and if it's like one person that knows the other person then i'm like oh i haven't talked to this person in a long time so it's uh yeah it's just it's just really cool and um a lot of people have joked and given me a hard time in the past about knowing like everybody or or knowing like a lot of people and um you know whether that's true or not like i'm not the one to make that to, like i don't make that judgment but um but yeah i i think that i get put in situations where um i can stay and 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 help people and and have those uh, um conversations yeah, yeah. Um, what other like questions do the both of you have? Cause I, mean that was really yeah. great, but was there anything that like anything that you wanted to ask me back then that you didn't get to, or even now with our, our conversation, anything that is sticking out? I have like one thing I was kind of thinking about, wanted to ask you about like how your, your kind of perspective, like of your disability and cerebral palsy has changed like throughout your life as you've gotten older if there's been like major changes or if it's kind of stayed the same or how has it looked like throughout your life since like childhood Mm, i remember talking to i'm not going to mention her name i remember talking to somebody who and i might be very vague who works for an organization that is not here in albuquerque and she had said something 
that like as she has gotten older, her cerebral palsy has, um, I mean, it's not progressive, obviously, but just like with the body and aging. So I think as I've gotten older, there have been parts of my legs that have gotten um, stiffer. So that just means I need to spend more time stretching. I need to um, get more massages regularly. I need to do the things to keep my body um, where, you know, in good enough shape, I guess. But um, I, oh, so like last year I went to um, Gillette Children's Hospital in Minnesota for a gait lab analysis. Um, Dr. Phillips, who runs the CP clinic here, recommended that I go out there. And um, when I finished all the tests, the orthopedic surgeon was telling me that as I grew, and you all can't see this because I'm not recording on video, um, but my legs, I think it was, um, I'm not even going to mention the anatomy cause I'm going to mess it up, <laughs> but, um, the leg was, didn't grow straight. So there's the bone that kind of like curves in, um, but there wasn't anything, uh, structurally wrong with my legs, which is a good thing. But I would say as I've gotten older, I just need more maintenance on um on my legs so yeah um i had a question i know i just remember i don't know if you were in the class at the time that she showed this video um but um dr armijo showed us a video of you working with mary beth um at one point running through one of the um just evaluation tests that kind of goes step by step through a bunch of different functional movements um i just remember there are points in there um or I guess you seemed a little bit maybe frustrated at some of the tasks that Mary Beth was asking you to do, not necessarily at her, but just at the task itself. Um, I just wonder if you could kind of speak to that, maybe like any of the emotions you were feeling and then how we as physical therapists can work through that with our patients. That is a very good question, Allie. And I usually don't talk about my frustrations on the podcast too. <laughs> I keep it all nice and happy and um, but no, I think it that's important. Um, yeah, I get frustrated a lot with myself. Um, another thing that people tell me is like, you're too hard on yourself. You're too hard on yourself. And it can be very, um, difficult when I do certain things with my body that won't cooperate the way that I want it to. So, um, especially when things are like out of my control, like there's only so much of my spasticity or muscle tightness that I can control. But I, yeah, I, I do get frustrated at times. A lot of, most of the time people don't, wouldn't even guess or know that about me because I try to, um, I don't want to say project a certain image, but I, try to stay as positive as possible and not let not less necessarily letting people know that I'm struggling because I think when I go out and about right I'm using my crutches so um maybe to a stranger there's already this visual of somebody's using crutches and that's like signaling help mm -hmm. right and over the years i've gotten better at asking people for help and it doesn't it doesn't bother me like it it used to but um i think already being in a situation where people are willing to help me um i don't want to give off another like reason to feel like vulnerable or, or frustrated. So, um, I think when, when I get tested by physical therapists and I'm not doing it the way that I want to, not the way that they are asking me to do it, but the way that I want to do it, it can be very difficult. Um, I, I think I, you know what, I've never had, uh, a bad experience with a physical therapist. 
I think part of that is because I've been so vocal um, because I'm, I'm a talker and I ask a lot of questions. And the more that I've gone to physical therapy, the more experience that I have. Um, another joke that people say is like, wow, you have had enough physical therapists. You could be a physical therapist. Like, I don't think so. Like, I know what you all go through and you spend a lot of time. And I, I would guess that my knowledge is probably 1% of the knowledge that you all have. Um, I mean, it's a nice compliment to, to, to kids, but, um, yeah, I I think that the physical therapists that I've had have done a good job with communicating and going over my goals. But I think what, and this is just my opinion, I think what makes a really good physical therapist is having empathy for the patient. And, um, you know, that may not, always be the case with um, physical therapists, like the patient PT relationship. But um, yeah, I think having empathy and, and not being afraid to, to ask questions about um, what the person may be going through. Um, because just because I'm going through the way that I feel, that may not necessarily be how another person um, and, or another patient feels um, that way. Um, but I think just having that open communication and not being afraid to have those interactions um, can can really uh, be beneficial down the road as you start to do the rotations and, um, you know, eventually getting into um, a job. Yeah, I think so. And just to touch on when you said, you know, like 1% of physical <laughs> 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 therapists, I just feel like that is, yeah, um, that's probably not true at all, first of all. <laughs> but um, I just think that it's such a, I think it's like a common misconception for medical providers, mm. and probably patients too, that we talk about this some in school also, that like um, the therapist is like the expert or whatever, and then the patient is like, you know, coming for help. but. I just feel like the amount of things that I've learned, even from just like kids, sure, you know, and these kids, I mean, they might not know. Yeah. Like the anatomy, like you mentioned, or some of these specific things that are going on in the muscle at like that level, but just their knowledge about their bodies and their ways to come up, like come up with their own solutions mm. is pretty inspiring and remarkable and something that I could never think of even after, you know, years of school. <laughs> so... I'm glad that you brought that up too, because I feel like people with disabilities are very, um, they're very adaptable. And I think that translates to us. And I, I rarely like to talk of using me as representation of like the whole disability community. But I think that enough people with disabilities would agree with me that um, we are problem solvers. And if we can't find a solution to one thing, um, one way, we'll figure out another way to do it because that's how we've been doing it our whole lives. And that just goes beyond physical therapy. That is, you know, trying to get into an inaccessible door or route, um, employment. Um, whatever it may be, like living alone or living with somebody, like, I don't know, there's so many examples that I could go down. But I think, yeah, Ali, what you said of how your, um, the kids have taught you so many things. Um, yeah, I agree with you 100%. Um, again, I never know what impact I have on other people until they like let me know and I may never know. But um yeah, I I try to make my own opportunities happen. Um, not because I have this negative view of the world that some people with disabilities do have, which I'm not judging them. Um, I think that's totally valid because as everybody in this room knows, like disability is such a spectrum of um, you know, 
whatever it may be. And some individuals, um, unfortunately, their challenges are greater than others, but that doesn't make them less than. Um, that just means they just have different challenges. Um, but I, I just view the world as whatever goals that I have, I'm going to accomplish them, but it may not be how Allie would approach it or Cameron or Dylan. And so I think the disability has allowed me to turn that into um, a strength. Mm -hmm. I had a quick question. I wanted to, I'm like wanting to know more about like resources for people with CP. Like when you were growing up, did you have any like support groups that you were involved with in Albuquerque or like the areas that you were living with? And no, um, and this, um, you know, I, this, I think speaks to the need for more resources. I remember, um, I could just have, I just have memories of working with Mary Beth and then going to um, the Carrie Tingley Hospital for surgeries. But in terms of like support groups and all of that, I didn't even know that those existed and wasn't aware that um, something was even going on with the Carrie Tingley Hospital until. I met John Chimarusti, um, the social worker that Ali referenced earlier. So no, but I know like there's other support groups like John's exist, and there's the C uh, CP clinic um, at UNM. So, but um, yeah, I think that there should be more of those um, conversations and support groups here locally. Yeah, I, uh, as I'm getting water, I'm talking a mid um, <laughs> sentence. So I'm, uh, we're at this table, right? And there's like a beautiful spread of uh, grapes <laughs> and snacks. And um, I, I'm sitting across from Allie, I'm painting all a picture, right? So I'm, pay I'm sitting across from Allie. She's got this water bottle with all these different stickers on it. It's like <laughs> some of them are really funny. Like I'm winging it and it's got the, uh, was it the scout? Yeah. Yeah. The scout? See, I know yeah. a little bit okay. of anatomy. Okay. I know that. <laughs> the only reason I know that is because I've had some issues with my scapula. So I know oh, yeah. that it's been bothering me. Um, and we didn't talk about this beforehand. So I'm, I don't know if I'm going to throw Allie off. Well, here we go. So I see the sticker right here that says faith, right? And then Allie's wearing this little, um, neck, necklace with the cross. So I'm wondering, I'm assuming, Allie, that you have some um, type of faith component to your life. And I'm just wondering how that has impacted how you see um, people with disabilities. Yeah, that's pretty big. Yeah, for me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would say that that's how I kind of, I try to view the world just in general through that lens of faith. Um, I guess maybe the best way to tell it, I kind of have a story that's um, pretty related to this. And it also ties into, we talked a little bit about um, the trip to Honduras that we had recently um, with a few other PT students, um, which I guess it just kind of, this is how I view um, things a little bit. So down in Honduras, in certain areas, this is a, a really rural area. And this is just a story I heard from somebody else um, that was down there. Um, there's not a lot of education regarding disability in the area that we were in. Um, so we had just heard some stories um, from a while ago, but just about this perception of um, maybe the kids that were born with disabilities, that it may have something to do with them being like, you know, it's like a sin or like cursed or something like that, like that sort of a perception. Um, and then actually the people, it was the person that had started this foundation that was telling me this story. Um, so that group kind of came into that situation, into that group of people who had this thought that disability had something to do with something that someone had done wrong or something like that. Um, and so the people had come in and just really provided that education. What they had told them is that, um, like, no, it's not a sin that these are like, god's special children like 
in different ways. A lot of these kids are um, at a lot lower of a functional level than even a lot of the kids with CP in America just because they don't have access to as much um, nutrition, medication, stuff like that. Um, so that, yeah, they had been told that, yeah, no, these aren't, like, your kid isn't messed up. Like, there's not um, some, like, spiritual reason that this is happening, but instead that this, like, is a valuable child of God. Um, no matter what their physical status is, I guess. Um, and so then years later, this is the cool part that I heard. It was a different person from that group. Um, I guess maybe, maybe it was the same kind of the missionary guy that had come in and started the foundation in the first place. Um, but a family had come up to him later and just was like, let me tell you, like, I am the most like blessed person in the whole world. And the guy was like, okay, like, yeah, why? Like, tell me more and stuff. And he was like, I have three of God's most special children in my house and like just that like shift in attitude of being like these are like precious kids that are like loved and um that have so much value that was just really cool to hear from like a parent's perspective just that change in attitude um yeah anyway so I guess for me um I think my faith impacts the way that I see just the whole uh, I guess everyone but um I think for me, it's about like the value of a human being. Like, I think in our culture, we really place a lot of value in somebody's ability to, you know, work and make a living and have all the money and have all of the things that um, everyone in America is striving for. Um, but I think just for me, it's like a perspective change of like every person is just like innately valuable whether or not they have the ability to speak or make a living or any of those things, like just them being a human makes them like valuable and worthy. And I guess kind of one last thing to tie it all. There's a lot <laughs> here, but um, there's one specific little girl in Honduras that we work with um, that I've seen now the past three years, every time I've gone there. Um, and she doesn't stop smiling. <laughs> she has, um, yeah, she has, I guess, quadriplegic CP, and she um, is nonverbal. So maybe by a lot of, like, the world standards, maybe not. She's not going to be able to, like, grow up and, like, make a living or, like, do many of the things that we would consider valuable. But, like, the girl has so much just joy. And for me, like, I would trade, like, anything to have the joy that she has, you know? And so just it's just where you place your value, I guess. And it has taught me a lot working with those kinds of kids and stuff like that. Yeah, I know that's a lot of information. That I'm is, not a lot. <laughs> that's, that's really cool. I remember years ago, I was on um, a faith-based uh, TV show. And I was talking about cerebral palsy. I'm trying to remember specifically why I was on there. I think it was because I wanted to start some type of like Bible study or something related to disability. And my aunt had got me connected over there. And so I um I had a, a I felt the interview went well, but like on the bottom of the screen had my phone number and my email address. And so after I had that conversation, I started getting phone calls from people who saw me on the <laughs> on the show. One man in particular, he called me up and he's like, oh, hey, I saw your interview on the TV and I uh, just want to let you know that there's this pastor that's going to be here in like three days and he has like the gift of healing and like you should like go and like you could be healed from like your cerebral palsy. And I had to like, politely be like uh i think i'm gonna be busy that day but you know thanks and then he would not stop calling me and he was just like so adamant that like well he was adamant that this person could heal me of my cerebral palsy and then that he thought that's what i was looking for when i had to just tell him like no um i'm not looking to get healed um that would actually probably be worse for me if I suddenly got healed 
Um, because like this is all that I've grown up with. So, um, you know, whether or not that would actually be um a possibility, like that's not even I can't even imagine what that is like because that's not like that's not even my yeah, that's not even my my thing to even think about. But to 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 have somebody think that healing would be like better for me and not to have a disability um it's not a bad thought like like no judgment on that person but it's i've never been someone to want that to be like healed and you know somebody told me like a long time ago that we're not uh you know bodies with souls we're souls with bodies right so um depending on what how you view view life and your values like you know where the souls are within us and then you know the body at some point is going to age and break down and then you know eventually we're all going to die um <laughs> but um our souls our souls will still be intact and the souls don't have the disability like our souls are what um are like operating our bodies to help other people while we're here on earth and so um like i, I didn't have that understanding at the time that this gentleman was like trying to get me to go over there and and get healed but um you know i've had i've had interesting um in conversations interactions with people that i remember one time long ago when i was in middle school we were eating um at a restaurant and waiting i was with my friend and this guy just uh he wasn't a guy he was like a, um <clears throat> an older like probably like 18 years or maybe early 20s he's just like hey do you mind if i pray for you right now i'm like sure why not? Um, so I I also think that having the disability um opens myself up to people to have conversations, which is never a bad thing because it's uh I can handle it pretty well depending on what's getting thrown my way. But um yeah. Yeah, that was uh mm -hmm. I went off on a little uh, a, a little detour there <laughs> with the with the faith component. So I don't know if anybody has anything to add um, on that. I was gonna add, yeah, I like the part you talked about, like how he thought you wanted like the healing, but then maybe that wasn't what you wanted. Kind of reminded me, um, like Cameron brought up our biopsychosocial class we mm -hmm. had, and I for that class we had to pick a project, and I read a book called um, Disability Visibility. Is the name of it um by alice wong yes yeah that one that one <laughs> and it's just like a bunch of stories um of like first-hand accounts of people living with disabilities which i, I really enjoyed that book um and that kind of reminded me because a lot of the people in that book talked about like the perspective of um pe other people like having the view that they couldn't live a happy life or that they would always be like wanting to be healed or like chasing some sort of cure um and a lot of the people in the book just talked about how like that wasn't the case and that was a lot of like maybe able-bodied views but really like these people found that they could still be happy and live a full like fulfilled life um and that that was a cool to see that like differing views between the two different parts of people and that was and that's so many of the stories in that book so i thought it was a really cool book yeah i know um a little bit about that book i've never talked with alice but i know she's really great in the um the advocacy world and mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I would be interested in reading some of those stories to get the different perspectives because, you know, a lot of, like, like maybe all the time I'm sharing my own perspective and not really bringing into the conversation of like other people's perspectives that I have read about or heard because obviously it's not good for me to speak on behalf of other people who have different disabilities, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I wanted to add on um during our second year we were learning about neuro conditions like the progressive disorders mm -hmm. or like conditions. Mm -hmm. And there's one um documentary that we watched on ALS called Gleason. Mm 
mm-hmm. and it followed was it Steve Gleason? Yeah, he was a former NFL player that um, unfortunately like like got like um, I don't know the terminology like how to say this, but like he has like ALS. Yeah, and um, like kind of like how you said like we received that call from that um, person, and he's like, oh, like I want to pray for you on a get like hopefully you can get fixed like. There's a really powerful scene in that movie, and um, they went to church and like they're like, we can we can get this fixed for you. So it was just like really interesting, like how like hearing your like perspective of like like living with disabilities and just kind of bringing more awareness to it. I feel like it's very powerful, and I feel like or that movie is really good watch. So I think it was on Prime Video. Okay, but yeah. So it was a really good watch, and he's still like uh, like living to this day. Like he. Just presented at the SBs like not so long ago. Oh, right yeah. on. Okay. Mm-hmm. They're a very powerful story, like listening and like just seeing him. He's a big advocate for ALS too. Oh. Mm-hmm. I I think having those individuals and having the representation, I mean, I think that's what makes disability so unique. And just the fact that you could have really great advocates for like cerebral palsy and then great advocates for ALS and then great advocates for spina bifida, great advocates for, you know, limb, um, uh, I don't know the correct terminology. And I don't want to go down the road and say something and then people get, you know, after me for saying that I described it wrong, but people that have, um, maybe lost a limb or whatever it may be. And so it's like, there's these different like silos that are advocated for in the areas, but you know, you can go to these different disability trade shows where there's like all a bunch of people with disabilities, different disabilities together, right? And that's just really just cool to see because it's like the disability ties us together, but we can also operate in our own little spaces. Mm -hmm. So that's just uh, like really unique. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if I have anything else for this episode. Um, is there anything else that you guys would like to add or ask me questions about? And I kind of feel like sort of along the same lines of what Cameron was just talking about, sort of bringing that into the advocacy. Mm-hmm. Um, Maybe the advocacy for people like us, like physical therapists and other just, I guess, allies. I don't know if that's the word that's mm-hmm. used in this. Sure. Um, but um, just the importance of, yeah, not superimposing like what our ideas are onto like the advocacy mm. in the advocacy piece of it. Like, you know, that was kind of maybe more of an extreme example of like when, yeah, like forcing someone like you need to get healed and mm. like that sort of way. But. I feel like that could show up in more subtle ways, like mm-hmm. what my idea is of like what you maybe are wanting. And then if I go and try to advocate for that mm-hmm. without building that collaboration and understanding, like, do people even actually want that? Like, is that mm-hmm. even the goal of people? Um, so I just think that that was a good point. It just made me start thinking about like, I guess that collaboration aspect of it. Um, like you need to talk to the people and really understand what, what they're goals are and what people are shooting for before going out yeah and i think to add on to that point which is why i enjoy talking to elementary school students like middle school students so much is because they're going to grow up and have various occupations that i know like this isn't a guess, like I know they will have a direct impact on the disability community and they might have influence of power that I may not have. Like just because I have a disability doesn't mean everything that I wish to get changed um, disability related, like it doesn't happen. Like you need other people to get um your goals done or to get a project done or whatever it may be. So um, I know that when the students grow up, they'll be a politician, they'll be a physical therapist, they'll be, you know, whatever, and they can have the ability to 
make either make things happen or work with the individual, like you were saying, Ali, to um, make those things happen. So um, that's why it's it's not just. I do think it's important to have other people with disabilities together and like push push like movements for like Judy Human and like that is great. I also think that the more people that we get who are physical therapists, who are um, special education teachers, who are speech language pathologists, who are in these other different areas and fields, um, <clears throat> that only um, helps us get to a more like equitable, equitable and accessible um, um, world. So, yeah. yeah. I wanted to ask, where do you feel like the common perceptions of like P uh, CP is like right now and just the general public, like when you kind of interact with people? Hmm. Um. It's. Uh, yeah, I think that maybe over the years, it's like shifted because and I've never had someone think of me in this way, but I know that if someone has a cerebral palsy, at least back when I was growing up and maybe their gait <clears throat> was a little off mm -hmm. and that would give off the perception that maybe this person has like a speech impediment or has something else, um, which wouldn't be the case, but, um, I think people would make, um, this is not now, this was back then, um, like a correlation between somebody walking funny to, well, they may s then sound funny. <clears throat> now, um, I, there's a comedian named Josh Blue, who I don't know if you've heard of him, but he won Last Comic Standing years ago. I've met him in person. Um, about 10 years ago, and I just saw him in person um, again. Oh, I think it was like March ish. Um, he walks funny and he sounds funny. So he is, uh, he talks about cerebral palsy and how he lives his life with CP, and he really like hammers that home. And he, I think he really does it in a really like disarming way. He says things that I, would never say um uh, as somebody with a disability just because like i think as i've grown up i know where my lane is and my lane is not to be like a josh blue like my i'm not gonna be an rj Mitty who was on breaking bad mm. um you know i'm just i'm just travis uh and i i do things in the way that i want to do them and um <clears throat> like for example i have a friend who lives in um florida i think it's tampa her name is chelsea bear who was on my um, podcast as well and she is a um an influencer and she has cp and she documents like her life and experience living with cerebral palsy and i think that is amazing like chelsea is awesome and if she ever um listens to this podcast and listens this far into the episode because i know we've talked for a long time <laughs> uh yeah i think chelsea's awesome um but my lane is not to just like make videos about my my life just because i don't think it's that exciting and i would much rather direct them over to chelsea or somebody else that's doing it way better than than me but um you know i think one of my strengths is listening to other people asking them questions like doing this podcast doing <clears throat> some of these things that uh um really brings me uh joy and uh to really get an understanding of like what other people are thinking and uh in that area so yeah <laughs> Well, I think that does it for this podcast episode. You're not going to get a normal outro from me like you would usually do. Um, but I want to say that if anybody's interested in 
donating to my campaign, the link is going to be in the show notes. And I have until the end of September to raise $7,500. And so I'm hoping that you all will um, <clears throat> consider donating to my campaign because it is going to um, help fund um, life saving research for um, individuals with cerebral palsy and other disabilities. And so I appreciate Ali, Cameron, and Dylan for coming on to this very special podcast edition. And I hope that in the future, I will do some more live podcast or in-person um, podcast uh, interviews. So thank you three for being on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.